Lovely to see you all again. This is the part of the meeting where I review some of the most interesting observations that have been submitted to us in the last month or so and look forward to what's happening in the sky uh, and over the next couple of months until the next meeting. So uh, weather has been a bit mixed, hasn't it? Not too good. Uh, I think most of our experiences have been rather like this image from Lee Spencer of the moon just peering out from bit behind some rather claggy skies and there's the moon with the shard in the background. Uh, but uh, I think this is the year of the moon really. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land, walking on the moon for the first time and uh, the year got off to a great start for lunar exploration with the Chang'e 4 uh, Chinese uh, lander landing the first time that a lander has landed and started exploring on the far side of the moon landing in the South Pole Aitken Basin uh, a tremendous step forward and uh, many people think it might herald a new age of lunar exploration a new age of competition in the space race maybe uh, as uh, the other uh, 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 powers don't don't want to get outflanked by China and uh, also India is so proposing to spend another probe to the moon so maybe there's an upsurge in interest in the moon uh, and uh, <coughs> I, I, I think there is because I've been asked to give quite a few talks about the moon this year and lots of societies are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the landings so I think this is a great time for lunar observation and I started off my lunar observations this year on January the 8th there's another rather claggy sky but I think that's quite a scenic view of the two day old moon of course we were all waiting for the 21st which was the lunar eclipse uh, scheduled to be the, the best lunar eclipse for, for um, the many years at, from the UK and the best for many years to come because it would the moon is above the horizon for the whole eclipse it's a total eclipse and uh, the uh, it, it, it's it's it the moon was high in the winter and well placed uh, so um, well uh, rather mixed results across the UK most people were clouded out for part of the eclipse some were clouded out for the whole of the eclipse the Midlands didn't seem to fare too well Alan Toff here in Scotland uh, he found it clouded over two minutes before totality but here's uh, an image that he got nevertheless with his uh, Celestron 9.25 and a Canon camera uh, I got a uh, rather similar experience really uh, the, uh, the night up to midnight was perfectly clear and then cloud gradually accumulated and the partial phases were seen quite well but just before totality it completely clouded over and this was uh, taken re really through the murk of thickening cloud uh, that was two minutes into the theoretical total eclipse and uh, shortly after that it disappeared completely but of course it's always clear in Celsius, isn't it? How do they do it? How does he do it? Uh, Pete Lawrence uh, got uh, this lovely image. I don't know exactly what equipment he used, but I know that this was a combination of uh, two different exposure, an exposure for the moon and an exposure for the surrounding stars. These are the observations of Thomas Jones in uh, Cornwall and he recorded, he started uh, taking uh, the, his images with the, full, the uneclipsed, totally uneclipsed full moon at half past two and then he recorded the penumbra. So it's interesting to see that because the penumbra is hardly detectable visually so it's interesting to see if you can detect it on similar exposures and I think it is coming out here somewhat I think even at about five minutes after the theoretical start of the penumbral eclipse you can detect a slight darkening on this side and, and it's very clear half an hour into the penumbral eclipse and then the umbral eclipse uh, started about, about five minutes before this image was taken so this, this is the latter stages of the penumbral eclipse and, and it really is quite clear there but he was clouded out before totality started as well uh, but in Luxembourg uh, Guy Hainan had slightly better results and he managed to get the whole event and get some nice shots of the totality as well so he produced a sequence there and there was an impact flash and this was observed by quite a few people it was imaged and seen visually and it was videoed uh, by at least 12 people this impact flash here shown in this still image by Christian Froschlin in the Netherlands 
Uh, and uh, this was um, so, uh, a, a, a meteor on the moon, a, a probably a, uh, something a bit larger than a grain of sand. Uh, and it has been seen before. In one previous lunar eclipse, there was uh, a flash detected. Uh, but uh, a lot of people corroborated this observation, and, and it will be published in the, uh, uh, the lunar section newsletter soon. But uh, eclipse or not, the moon is always a fascinating object to observe. And here's some lovely recent observations, again by this chap I mentioned just now, uh, Guy Heinen in Luxembourg. And he's using uh, C9.25. And uh, a, here this is taken with a ZWO camera. And uh, this is uh, the, the area of Aristarchus. This is taken just the day after the full moon and the eclipse. There's Aristarchus up there and uh, the Sch Schroeter's Valley, that winding valley, and, uh, the, and uh, Copernicus and uh, the Oceanus Procellarum up here. A beautifully sharp image and here's another of Guy's images. Uh, these are the, the, Magidus, the, Mar the Marius Hills and this is the best and uh, most uh, populous area of volcanic domes on the moon and they're in the Oceanus Procellarum <laughs> and they're best seen just before the full moon, a couple of days before January the 18th and some of them are, are topped with uh, ejection craters. So these are some of the best examples of, uh, we believe, volcanic features on the Moon. The, Mar the Marius Hills on the Oceanus Procellarum. So here's the phases of the Moon for uh, the next month or so. Uh, we're, uh, we're just about coming up to last quarter now. So uh, we observe the Moon mainly around first quarter. The next first quarter is uh, 12th of February, then it's full on the 19th, and uh, we've got uh, the next first quarter after that on, the, on March the 14th. Uh, also of interest, the Moon is passing close to the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44, on February the 18th, and here's a planetarium simula simulation showing what that will look like. Uh, and that will fit in a binocular field or a wide field, telescope field, you'll be able to see that uh, famous cluster with the moon there, but it'll be a nearly full moon, so how much you'll be able to see, it would be interesting to see, uh, be, depend on the quality of the baffling in the telescope and uh, how good the contrast is. And uh, of course, with, with imaging, you would have to do something like uh, Pete Lawrence did with the lunar eclipse. Uh, you would have to uh, give completely different exposures for the moon and the cluster. And uh, later, that's, this is a view from shortly after midnight on February the 18th. Slightly later, uh, around at uh, 5:53, uh, Delta Can Cancri, uh, which is uh, uh, Mag 4 star, will be occulted at the dark limb, and that, that's the best occultation in this, uh, this uh, in the next couple of months. So that. Um, we can def we'll be definitely should be able to see, so that might be worth looking out for that night. On to the sun. Uh, not a lot of activity on the sun, not zero, but not very much. But uh, Dave Tyler, one of our most stalwart lunar, rather solar observers, uh, takes images on every possible day. And uh, here's a small active area, AR2733, and that's the 22nd of June. And he's also got an image of the corresponding white light view. So it's an extremely small spot group. So the, 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 the sun remains very quiet, but uh, there is uh, some low level activity there. Moving on to the planets. Well, I've got all the planets in one slide here. This was uh, the BAA picture of the week recently. This is um, my friend Martin Lewis in St Albans, and he won uh, one of the prizes in Astronomy Photographer of the Year last year, one of the runner-up prizes for the equivalent image that he produced last year of all the planets imaged with his home-built telescope all in the same year, all by him. And he's been able to do that for the last three or four years. And here's his version, uh, the, the latest version for, for, for last year, for 2018. All the planets scaled to the size they actually were when they were at their largest uh, and laid out like that. So he is one of our, our, our most accomplished planetary images. And uh, here is... Uh, an interesting grouping of planets in reality 
they're grouped within, will be grouped within about eight degrees of the sky uh, on the morning of January the 31st. So that will make a good uh, photo opportunity, an opportunity to see Venus with the Moon and Jupiter, the Moon in the middle. And you'll see that uh, Saturn may just be caught in the twilight. You may not catch it until February, uh, because obviously it's so much fainter than Venus and Jupiter but uh, it uh, is just coming out of the twilight now. And we've just had a close approach of Venus and Jupiter on January the 23rd, and one day after closest approach, James Dawson captured this view uh, from Nottingham with his 150 millimeter telescope. I haven't had a lot of uh, images of Venus. People don't observe the morning Venus very much. They're obviously rushing off to work or get better things to do or other things to do. Not better, obviously nothing's better than uh, <laughs> observing planets. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so we don't get many of the morning elongations of Venus. Uh, here's one from Simon Kidd taken on the 20th of January and this is in infrared. Now, sometimes you get more detailed markings in infrared than this but uh, there's not very much uh, visible here. Uh, but uh, Venus is certainly dominating the morning sky at the moment and will continue to do so for about the next month. It's magnitude minus 4.4. Another interesting close approach we will have will be on February the 12th uh, when in the evening sky this time Mars and Uranus or Uranus are only one degree apart and they're in Pisces so they might well fit in a low power telescope field. I haven't got a picture of that but I've got a picture of a similar thing. Uh, this is Mars and Neptune imaged uh, on the 7th of December by Robin Skagel. There's Mars up there. Uh, so uh, that, 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 that's the kind of view that you might you might expect. Well, Mars is still uh, quite prominent in the evening sky. It's, it's about uh, magnitude uh, zero now, but it has been getting higher, and there's been a bit of a resurgence of interest in Mars observation in the last few weeks, uh, both because it's much higher than it was at opposition for northern hemisphere observers, and also because a dust storm was reported. A regional dust storm was reported as being uh, seen on January the 5th, and these are observations from Japanese observers taken from the uh, ALPO Japan website. And uh, the uh, dust started in, uh, here in uh, an area called Chrysi, and it's spread <coughs> wider into parts of the Mare Arithraeum. Uh, I haven't seen any convincing <coughs> images from Britain which show the same dust event, but people have been looking for it. And here's Mars, imaged again by Martin Lewis on uh, January the, uh, the 20th. And uh, considering the tiny size, it's, um, it's up to 43 degrees high, but it's only 6.6 .6 seconds in diameter. And this is taken with Martin's uh, roughly 18-inch uh, uh, Dobsonian, 444 millimeter with an ASI 1224 camera. Uh, and uh, just today, uh, Martin sent me another image which I managed to uh, include today. Oh, it's disappeared. Oh, no, if that was in the version on, which is not on the stick. But uh, he, he did one comparing how big Mars was uh, when it was at its opposition with how big it is now. And it was about five times the size. It was like this by comparison. So uh, that just shows you how impressive the detail on a disk like that actually is. Uh, Jupiter has come out from the morning twilight but it's uh, poorly placed for observers in this country and it will be for the rest of 2019 but much better placed from the southern hemisphere and these are the first good observations I've seen of Jupiter since a solar conjunction taken by our friend uh, Clyde Foster in uh, Centurion, South Africa. Clyde has visited several of our meetings here and if you've met him you'll know what a, an amazingly enthusiastic and happy guy he is and he takes part in uh, uh, international research um, uh, planetary programs uh, coordinated by the, the the Juno project and he goes to meetings all over the world and he just got into this in his retirement and such an enthusiastic guy here's uh, another one from him the great red spot uh, and uh, 
I saw him at the meeting that we had in May here at where uh, we uh, uh, amateurs for all, all over the world were sponsored by NASA to come and discuss the Juno results and ha amateur contributions. This was the RAS Juno conference, and this is in the uh, li this picture is taken in the library of the Linnaean Society. There's Clyde, and he's always smiling. And this is Christophe Pellier, another uh, well-known uh, obs planetary observer from France. And uh, Unfortunately, the day after that picture was taken, Clyde had a terrible accident. He was hit by a motorbike on Charing Cross Road. He was rushed to, Charing, uh, to King's College Hospital in South London. His pelvis was shattered and he had to have an emergency operation and he couldn't go back home. And I went to see him in hospital and he, 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 was, he was taking it all in, in, as well, amazingly well. He, he was using the time to read up books about how you automate your observatory because he realised he wouldn't be able to walk for a while so he wanted to automate his setup and he posted a picture on Facebook of him walking around the hospital on, on crutches with, with the caption, where's the observatory? So you'll be pleased to hear that he's ma made a fantastic recovery and uh, he has succeeded in automating his observatory to a considerable extent and he's taking the first good images of Jupiter following solar conjunction. Unfortunately, I can now talk about Christoph, who's also in this picture taken in the Linnaean Society next because he's been uh, doing something slightly different with Jupiter. He's been uh, taking spectra, he's been using the star analyzer 100 uh, lines per millimeter grating uh, to smear Jupiter out into spectrum and uh, he, so here is the, this is the spectrum, this is the graph of wavelength against intensity and uh, this is for the various regions of Jupiter, North Equatorial Belt, South Equatorial blue is the south tropical zone, you see the south tropical zone is the light is more biased towards the blue end. So this is to try and put on a slightly more quantitative basis the work that we've long done to estimate the colours of the Jovian bands and their intensities which tends to be done, done just by estimates, we've traditionally done by visual estimates of intensity and description and so on. So uh, we're trying to put this on a more scientific basis and continuing this work forward we'll be able to see how the spectra of the individual bands on Jupiter, the individual latitudes, changes from one apparition to the next. Moving further out into the solar system, here's uh, some more excellent images from Martin Lewis, uh, 24th of December and that is Uranus and some of its moons. Triton and uh, another moon. Triton and uh, Neri. That would be um, no. So I'm talking rubbish. Those are Neptune, aren't they? So this is Uranus, but this is Neptune. This is Neptune with Triton and Nereid. Uh, this is imaged uh, by Paul Leyland, and he's using quite a large telescope, 0.4 meter Cassegrain telescope with an S big camera, and he says that. Uh, he just took this one image of uh, Neptune and this is Triton here and that would, they, were, they were overexposed even at a three second exposure but uh, Nereid is revealed here by a stack of images and the uh, stack of images, I think, that I can't read it now but it's something like 400 images of the, oh, I can't remember the total exposure but uh, it's, there's a, a lot of exposure has gone into that and Nereid is about 18th magnitude. Moving even further out into the solar system, these images have come down the pipeline just the other day. Ultima Thule, uh, 6.5 billion kilometres from the Sun, the most distant object ever visited by a space probe, <coughs> imaged uh, by the New Horizons probe on the 1st of January and what with the very slow bandwidth uh, that we've just accumulated this enough data now to produce that image. It's, it's a rock 30 kilometres by 10 kilometres, you can very clearly see its binary nature, how it has um, evolved as two separate objects that have clearly fused together, they're iced together in, in this, this bright colour there. So that is uh, Incredible. Moving 
then that takes me neatly on to the cometary situation. Here's the comets that are visible from the UK at the moment that are brighter than magnitude 10 according to uh, the uh, comet section website and it's not too bad. Sometimes I've given these talks and I've had to say there's nothing brighter than magnitude 12 but uh, we've got several comets that are brighter, this, well we've got five comets brighter than magnitude 10 and we've got one mag 8 and one mag 9 so um, Young Nick is not, not doing too badly here. Could, could do better, but uh, we think, think, think things have been worse in, often been worse in the past. So we've had some quite interesting comets. Uh, most of the uh, interest is centered on Virtanen, this very uh, large comet, or apparently large comet, because it uh, was uh, close to the Earth and uh, was uh, theoretically got up to fourth magnitude, but it, the light was very spread out, spread out over an area about maybe twice the full moon depending on how you how you define the area of the comet so actually rather difficult to see and almost impossible to see in light polluted skies but we've got this new comet on the block that's been discovered this year Iwamoto and uh, that's magnitude 9 but it's brightening it's quite low down but it's getting higher and it's getting visible earlier so I'll say some more about that in a moment other comets about at the moment 38P, Stefan Otema, magnitude 10, <coughs> visible all night. Atlas, uh, 2018 L2, that's another mag 10, early evenings and in the mornings. And 64P, Swift Gerels, visible in the evening, mag 10. But uh, as I say, most, most uh, interest is focused on Virtanen or Wirtanen. And uh, here's an image I took from Edgware with uh, Celestron 11 and the Hypersar system, which is a fast system, F2, and that's a stack of one minute exposures stacked on the comet, so obviously the stars are trailed. That's 31 minute exposures, but I could not see it visually. I looked with small telescopes, I looked with a 10 inch uh, F4.8 uh, telescope, and I could not see it. But my friend, um, uh, Ken Meadows, uh, who lives in Neesden, and has even worse light pollution, he saw it through binoculars, through big binoculars. I can't remember what they were, 100 millimeter binoculars or something. So maybe that's the key to these sort of objects, is big binoculars, and he was able to make a drawing of it. Uh, here's an image from Robin Skagel, taken from Buckinghamshire, from a slightly darker site. And uh, this was taken with a telephoto lens, 135 millimeters and uh, a, 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 this is a single exposure with a, a Canon 70D and uh, Robin actually did something quite interesting he juxtaposed one of his images against one of taken by Damien Peach and uh, the Damien image here that is taken with a one meter chili scope but Robin has scaled his image to, and rotated it to be exactly equivalent you can see that they imaged at exactly the same time from England and Chile there's, there's this line of stars, this, this, this line of stars, there, that's that star close to the cometary nucleus. So very similar times and uh, this was taken with only an 80 millimeter telescope and that was with a one meter telescope. So that, uh, that's an interesting comparison. Uh, so this uh, new comet was discovered uh, by um, Meisak, Mr. Iwamoto, I won't, won't try <laughs> saying that anymore. And uh, it was his second discovery in, in two months, his photographic discovery, and it's coming to perihelion soon, February the 6th, and very conveniently, shortly after, it's very close to the Earth, it's only 0.3 AU, and so we think it might get up to magnitude 6. Of course, these estimates always come with a big health warning, they can go very wrong, but uh, it's one worth watching. Here's an image taken by Nick with uh, an eye telescope, a remote telescope, on December the 29th, and it was quite difficult to get then, it was low down, and it, it, it was... Um, yeah, it was not too bright, but uh, it's, uh, it's moving north. So here is the path of it. Uh, this is the path from early January up till early February. So uh, we're about here, uh, late January. It is uh, between Corvus and Virgo, and it will be at perihelion when it gets to Leo. And so you'll see it passes quite a few deep sky objects, quite a few famous objects like Messier 95 and other galaxies, so there'll be good opportunities to image it in the same field as interesting deep sky objects, and then it should be at its brightest when it is close to Regulus. 
So uh, Iwamoto is uh, probably the best comet in the next couple of months. Uh, none of the comets I've shown you so far have looked very comet-like, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is a rather lovely image, again from Damien Peach, again with the one metre chili scope, and that's really what comets should look like. Uh, and this is, this is, is, is called uh, Chushin Shan. It's 60p, Chushin Shan, but it's, it's quite faint, uh, so, and it's uh, best seen from the Southern Hemisphere, so I don't think you'll see it from here, but I thought I'd show that as, uh, as an image of really the cl a classic comet shape. Much fainter comet here, uh, David Swan in time has been doing photometry and faint comets, and uh, this is... Uh, 2018 A3 and, uh, and very in a single exposure it's only just detected there and uh, he, he says it's, it's less bright than the minor planet centre prediction and um, Peter Carson has also been making estimates of its brightness which, which seem to agree. There's a bit more photometry. This is uh, an object uh, Dave Smith in Essex has been observing, the 973 CFI, and he observed it on the lunar eclipse night. Uh, so he thought he'd combine observing the lunar eclipse with following this variable throughout the night. He wanted to get a few cycles of it, but unfortunately he was clouded over at 2am. Uh, but he started uh, early, he started about 5pm, so he's got quite a few cycles in here. And uh, this was taken with a Celestron uh, 11, and. Um, a, a mono CCD, and uh, this is the software used to process it, Astro Image J, which is a, a free image processing package, and uh, two meter exposures. And uh, what this object is apparently, I'd never heard of this before, this is called a HADS. This is a high amplitude Delta Scuti star, and its period is only 116 minutes and its uh, variation is about half a magnitude, so that's uh, uh, very interesting, and uh, they, they, these uh, Delta Scuti stars, apparently they have oscillations in various directions, in equatorial directions and polar directions, and they are somewhat related to the Cepheid variables, and they also act as standard candles. There is a relationship between their period and their luminosity as measured at certain wavelengths. So uh, that's uh, an interesting object. Here's another object, the BSBAA variable star uh, section is, has a campaign to observe at the moment. Uh, this is the cataclysmic variable, HSS 0229 plus 8016, 016, uh, and it has outbursts constantly, it has 0.7 mag outbursts, and uh, the period is 12-14 uh, days. Jeremy Shears uh, reports that uh, our efforts, uh, well, our efforts started, uh, I think, on this um, only in the last couple of months. Our efforts are paying dividends, revealing a very interesting light curve. We have observed six of its small oscillations. The fifth looks slightly different from the others. Uh, and uh, more observations appreciated. Observations so far from Richard Sabo, Ken Menzies, Gary Poyner, David Boyd, Dave Smith, Ian Miller, David Storey, uh, Mr. Dufour, Martin Mobley, Jeremy, and um, gone off the edge of the slide, unfortunately. So about, uh, about a dozen people collaborating there on that project. Uh, here's another object which has uh, been uh, behaving surprisingly in brightness, and this was pointed out recently but on the uh, BAA website by Robin Ledbetter, and Robin, you, you may have well have heard his talks about spectroscopy. He's been specialising recently in spectroscopy of supernovae and classifying supernovae. He's one of the first amateurs to actually start classifying supernovae themselves and getting ser taken seriously by the professionals in the field as obtaining good results. This supernova, 2018 HNA in UGC, very faint galaxy, UGC 7534, discovered by uh, Itagaki uh, on November the 22nd, has had very unusual behaviour. It's been uh, increasing in magnitude very slowly. It's point increased from about 16th magnitude to about 
14th magnitude in two months and uh, this is very unusual behavior and uh, R Robin points out that the uh, spectrum is not quite that all that clear uh, it, it, we're not quite sure what type of supernova it is but it may be similar it seems to be similar in behavior to the famous 1987a supernova in the large Magellanic cloud that has a similar uh, very slow rise and it's now within the range of amateur instruments so uh, it could potentially be observed with a reasonable size amateur telescope and spectrum could be taken with an ALF P spectrograph or, or a, a LIRES instrument so it's uh, within the amateur range to actually get a spectrum of this interesting object another distant object that's been varying recently is McNeil's Nebula uh, this is a picture showing the absence of something uh, uh, Nick Hewitt uh, got this telescope off the eye, this, this image from Eye Telescope in New South Wales just yesterday. Uh, McNeil's Nebula should be near M78. This is M78, and this is an image by Mr. McNeil himself, and it should be here. So if you take M78 and you look at these stars, and then you go to this pair of doubles, this double star here, then the nebula discovered by J. McNeil what is just next to there so there's M78 there's this line of stars there's the double star there's absolutely nothing there at the moment so McNeil's nebula has disappeared so it's uh, being monitored yes. we're monitoring it uh, if you want to know where that is here's a, a wider field much wider field image of Orion this is a, another lovely image posted on the BAA website uh, this is from Steve, Wright, Steve Knight in Northumberland, taken uh, with an 85 millimeter, uh, a very fast lens, f1.4, with a Canon 6D camera. So here you see uh, Barnard's loop, there's uh, the Orion Nebula, there is, this is the region of the Horsehead and the Flame Nebula, and you'll find M78 between Alnitak, which is this star, and Betelgeur, which is this star, it's about a third of the way up, and it's pretty faint in this image, it's, uh, this image is biased towards um, narrow band, biased towards hydrogen alpha and M78 is a broadband object but it's actually here and so McNeil's uh, nebula is in that area. And on the subject of Orion, uh, the, we we're collaborating again with the Council for Protection of Rural England, uh, Orion Star Camp, the campaign rather for protection of rural England Ryan Star Count on February 2nd to 23rd. We're asking people all over the country, the general public, to count the number of stars in this area bounded by the, the main stars of Orion. And this gives us a measure of how light pollution is varying across the country, how it's changing with time. And these have been done before at intervals, I, I don't know, of three or four years or so. And uh, this, it gets quite big publicity uh, through social media and through various websites and uh, we can this is very valuable data for our commission for dark skies and uh, it, in their, their campaigning so the idea is to count count the stars in here uh, on, you know, on a bad night from my observatory in london i can only see the main the main seven stars uh, on a better night maybe those two as well maybe that one maybe I can get up to about 12 stars but never never more than that and there's a table you can look up that corresponds to the number of stars you can see in that quadrilateral with the limiting magnitude and and about 12 stars corresponds to about 4.5 and if, if your sky is limited to three then you'll only see the main seven stars so this is this is all, all, all uh, very useful uh, publicity for us and uh, on the outreach front also just mentioning the uh, Patrick Moore Prize which at the, our Christmas meeting we gave to Eric Ems one of the main organizers of the Baker Street Irregular Astronomers who've been bringing astronomy to central London to Regent's Park and they held their 100th meeting uh, two days ago and I was there so I'll just show you some pictures of that show you what that's like and uh, 
the, the Sky at Night came along, a Sky at Night team, and um, they did some filming, and that will be broadcast on February the 10th, 10 p.m. on BBC4, and uh, Pete Lawrence was there, and uh, it was, it was a, a good crowd of people, and uh, yeah, I, what amazed me, really, was the scale of equipment that people bring along these days to this kind of thing. Uh, this is, there's the 100, 150 that there's a 150 millimeter refractor that Simon Bennett brings along. There's somebody brought along a radio antenna to do radio detection of meteors. And in the background here, there's a 12 inch, somebody actually bring us, brought a 12 inch telescope on an equatorial mount. I know people often carry around Dobsonian, Dobsonian telescopes in that kind of range, but to get one on an equatorial mount, that, that takes some doing. And you have to bear in mind, this is nowhere near a road, you can't drive in there, you, so with it, people have to devise all kinds of methods of wheeling this equipment, the two, I think it's about, uh, it's about, it's nearly half a, half a kilometre from the road to the centre of the park. Uh, and uh, here's another view, and there's, there's Pete Lawrence, the back turn to us, talking to Simon Bennett of the widescreen centre. <coughs> And there's the hub where refreshments are taken and you can warm up. And it, got, it did get really cold. The telescopes got iced up this time um, by, by half past ten. I could hardly touch my telescope. I was able to carry it in there and disassemble it in the warm there. So I, I've tried to show you tonight, uh, I'm just, just about at the end, tried to show you some of the many and varied things that the amateur astronomers in the BAA do. They, uh, many are observing very faint objects with uh, high precision techniques. Have you heard tonight? Others are taking uh, amazing, attra amazing attractive images and trying to interest the general public, doing outreach. But uh, you can never tell where this kind of thing will lead and uh, you, you would never guess that a career in planetary observing would lead to your images on confectionery. But that's what Martin Lewis found. Here's the... <laughs> Here's his uh, parade of the planets, which was one of the runners-up in last year's uh, Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition, and uh, the Greenwich Observatory have put it on their clotted cream fudge. And uh, bearing in mind all the difficulties our political leaders are having uh, with uh, negotiating <laughs> a way forward for this country, perhaps they could do with some of that fudge. And. Uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I will say no more about that, and uh, we'll see you all next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>